and hello everybody hello it's so nice to be here with zach hi zach hey michael um and hello to everyone watching uh please let us know if the audio is weird if the levels are strange but i think it should be fine um <laughs> yeah so this is fourth se uh, episode of my uh fourth season of the messy desk and i'm excited to have zach here fellow canadian guitarist in europe uh <laughs> very nice um do you want to give people a little quick rundown of who you are zach and what you do as a guitarist uh sure uh my name is zach i'm uh uh originally from ottawa canada uh where i did an undergrad at carleton university with a guy named uh, stephen rollins then a then a master's degree at the university of ottawa with the uh the canadian guitar quartet there then I uh, started traveling abroad and ended up here. Nice. Um, yeah. And when you were in Ottawa, was it you were sort of taking lessons with all members of the quartet, or did you have a specific teacher there? Who... No. So um, my first year of my master's was with Phil Candelaria. Okay, cool. And then the second year was with Dennis Donagani, but I also had Louis Trepani as a, as a chamber coach. Okay. So three out of the four, and there, I think I took like two or three lessons over the years with Patrick, nice. but yeah. Cool. I'm sure you got to see some of his teaching being in Ottawa, you know, in master classes and stuff. And... Um, I actually never, I, I never saw him give a master class. It, it's, um, I think that's very European to just say, okay, well, I'm giving a lesson at this time, everyone come and right. watch. So it, it, it wasn't quite like that. Yeah. Um, but but having said that, like I, I've I've known tens and tens of his students. Right. Yeah, that's so. um actually something that I found interesting when I moved here because I did I did a master's in Maastricht with Carlo Marchione and mm -hmm. he has this like open door policy. I don't know if it was the same way in Alicante when you came, but you can just walk into other people's lessons and he has like a Google sheet where people write what they're gonna play, so you can be like, oh, this person's playing, you know, this piece that I'm interested in. Uh, it was very different than in Canada. From my experience i think don't don't quote me on this but i think that's more of a northern european thing because oh, okay. there, there there are stories of people going to france and it was open door or at the mozartium it's open door or, or these things but um i'm not 100 percent sure if that's everywhere okay nice yeah okay interesting oh i guess well that's the other part of the story that i <laughs> that i left yeah, out yeah. how so, did you get to europe <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so after my master's at Ottawa U, I then did a um, second master's in the in the Alicante program. Nice. I knew um, the first time I heard about this was because of Alec, another Canadian guitarist, Alec Pearson. Yeah. So so Alec and he he was the year after me, and he was with this other guy named Trevor from Trevor Cooper, from yeah. Cool. yeah from Edmonton. So I was talking a bit with both of them and, and we've kept in touch over the years, but it, it's kind of funny. I've, I've now known those guys for, well, since 2014, we started communicating. I've met Trevor in person once. Yep. I've never met Alec. So yeah, it's funny how yeah. you make these friends at these guitar events. You know, I mean, like, you know, our mutual friend, Nathan Bredesen, who wrote me an awesome Sonata. And we've, we now have a duo together. We've done a tour together and stuff. And we've never lived in the same city. We just got to know each other from like traveling to study programs together, you know? It's well, well, that was that, that was the thing about your 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 kind of your circle in these events was we know a lot of people of the same people, but there's not always a direct connection, mm -hmm. right? Like I I'm not sure how you know like the other people that studied in Ottawa or Toronto because I I don't think you ever studied there, but you you have all these we have all these mutual contacts yeah it's kind of crazy oh and trevor speaking of mutual contacts trevor cooper in the chat says hey mike could you turn up your mic a bit zach's volume is great okay i'm gonna turn up a little bit tell me if it's clipping i think it should be fine um or if it's good now um yeah that's a great way to put it i mean it's kind of funny because you can't sometimes you can't even pinpoint when you met someone if you go to a lot of the same events like nathan mm -hmm. and i were trying to write bios for like a grant application for our duo and i was like wait did we meet in montreal or did we meet in hamilton was it 2015 was it 2004 right. you know like it's just hard to pinpoint sometimes how these things start um mm -hmm. yeah but that's super cool okay well we're gonna move on from you know your history if people have questions about that please put in the chat. I'd love to hear more from Zach about that. But I want to ask my gotcha question. Zach, are you ready for the gotcha question? Yes. Do you know what it is from watching the show? Nope. 
Uh, what is classical guitar? How do you define classical guitar? It's anything you want it to be. <laughs> anything you want it to be. Very good. Okay. Because? Well, your repertoire is much different than maybe some things I would play or some things I play aren't necessarily what you'd play. And then Yamashita plays stuff that neither of us play, <laughs> but they all else plays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know if you notice this, but like once in a while on, on like YouTube, there's new things of arrangements that he did like 30 years ago. That no one talks about. It. I know I, you can go and, to like, and, Yamashita rabbit hole is deep. I, you know, and, and it, and it freaks me out. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, cause I, I look at that and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Like this guy in like, I don't know, in like a decade span, you look at how many things he like arranged and then performed and then recorded. And you're like, is he human? You know, like, I don't think so. I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, that's a good point. I mean, the repertoire is that's, I was trying actually, I was just having this conversation this morning with a student who's like, um, he started out with me not having learned any guitar and, he went down the classical road kind of his, of his own volition, which is, you know, not always the case. But, you know, he was asking, like, how do you define classical guitar to me? And I was, like, trying to explain all the different kinds of repertoire. And then he's like, but this isn't classical music. I was showing him some, like, contemporary music. And it's just like, that's, I guess that's my issue with the term is, like, it doesn't always communicate to people what it really is because it, it's so broad, you know, in a way. Yeah. Um, if you're looking for, a, like, a technical definition, I would probably keep it simple and just say, Classical guitar is has the potential of being poly, like polyphonic, whereas yeah. aside from finger style jazz playing mm -hmm. you, or like bebop stuff, you're you're not you're not concerned with the three levels of um, score. Yeah, right? I mean, I, I'm thinking in Spanish, but like yeah. it's if you're playing rock guitar maybe you're thinking about rhythm or you're thinking about lead. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're not thinking about necessarily those at the same time or even with the harmony at the same time. Yeah. Actually, this is, I'm making a video for this GFA TV series and that's, I'm trying to make a video to help students think polyphonically from an early stage. Cause I think a lot mm -hmm. of students, even ones who are playing classical guitar music don't necessarily have that mindset from the get go. Cause they came from, maybe other types of guitar, that kind of thing. And it's, yeah, it is one of the unique factors. I mean, that's kind of what I told him was like, A, the instrument itself, you know, the strings, mm -hmm. the construction, the playing techniques, and then also the the fact that we are the whole band, you know, not one part of the band, so to speak. But yeah, it's still, yeah, it's just interesting like that. And, and I think that's, that's what I love about classical guitar though, is that we all have different repertoires and I think that's beautiful, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so what is your repertoire? What do you gravitate towards playing? What have you gravitated towards playing throughout the years? And has that changed? So what would you define as my repertoire? Hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm very much like, a, hey, I like that. I'm going to play it. OK. But whether it's Renaissance Baroque, Spanish music, contemporary, whatever it is, it's I'm, I, I feel drawn to it, and I'll play it. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, like some of the more classic pieces in the repertoire, I, I really just try to avoid. Mm -hmm. I'm 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 not gonna wake up tomorrow and go let's pl let's play uh, Spanish romance. Yeah, like <laughs> I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Uh, and and it's not because that's not a, a great tune. It's just, and this is something we were kind of talking about before before we went live here. But. Uh, uh, if you're, if you're thinking about kind of selling your product, no one's going to find me on YouTube if I only do Spanish romance, right? True, yeah. Although sometimes throwing in one of the classics really does help the... <laughs> but, but, but uh, yes, 100%. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, to make my... Rep uh, to, to make a concert just like, gonna go play the, the hits yeah it, it doesn't draw me in the same way that that saying you know there's a, a big musical piece that i'm really enjoying and i you know what let's get rid of that that i put a ton of work into it and let's go play spanish romance or or something like I, that well i mean i think that regardless of, of what reasons you choose otherwise the main one should be that you love the piece right so I, mm -hmm. I, I firmly believe that playing the hits is great 
if you love them. And I just wish that more players at a younger age, maybe, or or even also teachers, would encourage younger players to sort of um, to sort of pursue what 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 will make them a well-rounded musician in training, but also what they love artistically. Because at the end of the day, you're going to want to build an artistic identity that's unique. You know, whether mm-hmm. that's playing the hits or specific types of hits, or whether that's playing other things, it should really be based on what you enjoy. Because you're going to be playing those pieces a hell of a lot, especially if you do pieces for like competitions or or big concerts, mm-hmm. like big hard pieces. You know, you need to play them for a few years before they're really settled. So mm-hmm. pick your repertoire carefully, you know, and make sure you enjoy it, right? Yeah, yeah. Like even the um, when the pandemic started, I was kind of I was a little bit lost with the guitar because. I was in the middle of the the, the video from before the the, the guitar duo. Mm-hmm. We 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 did a concert two weeks before confinement, right? And we had another one booked, and then I had this other project with guitar and flute. So I'm going okay. Well, I'm locked here by myself. I don't have the the duo partners. What what do I want to work on? Like, I need to yeah. start playing solo pieces again. Yeah. So. I really liked the the 1009 cello suite, the last movement. The last movement, I was just kind of like in love with the um, the this kind of theme that comes up. But then I'm going, well, if I'm gonna play the last movement, I should probably look at the other ones because, you know. Yeah. And I really fell in love with the prelude. Working through the prelude and working through the entire suite, I was just really really passionate about it, and and I was feeling really good with it, and that's the kind of that's the kind of thing i would be confident in saying hey this is my artistic vision exactly yeah. you can you can you can hear my personality in this and if if we're talking about like pedagogy and teaching arguably that experience also taught me that university uh guitar instructors should probably be promoting the cello music instead of the actual loop music for for guitar students because the you know the A minor fugue and the and the D major fugue and prelude fugue and allegro like those are bastards those are hard to play those are crazy hard on the hands uh, the other movements of those suites are as well but in the cello music you have a line and you have some accompaniment so it's much easier to to you can argue the the approach to fingering it has to become it's much more centered on the phrasing then and you can yeah. work much much more detailed and achieve a much higher level of of yeah. the understanding of the, the phrasing and everything and sound production and whatnot based on something that's easier to play but musically perhaps just as complicated yeah that's very true um i mean the lute music is yeah deceptively named you know so um yeah. for all sorts of reasons uh, there, sorry, there's some comments and questions I want to get to here. Philip says, greetings to you both. Or classical defar- guitar defined as Segovia did a little orchestra with huge polyphonic possibilities. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, different voices as we were talking about. John Cesar says, the next question should be what defines a classical guitarist? And he says, in all honesty, Spanish romance gets more views than most. Right, but is the, is the goal more views or is the goal, you know, recording what you want to record? I don't know. I guess it depends on the person. I, I think it's actually neither yeah okay it's 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 creating your identity Mm -hmm. yeah so let's say i'm proposing a concert to a a promoter and you're proposing a concert to a promoter Mm -hmm. part of that is going to be are there things people will recognize if you just do for as much as we may love modern music if you're just going to do a modern music program they're going to think about that a lot differently than if you do a well-rounded program with a hit or two yeah in it so that the, those two approaches are, are much different and they they have a, a bigger result on the on the character and, and what you're thinking uh again i'm not trashing spanish romance it's a good yeah. tune yeah, yeah. but what yeah, i yeah. what i'm saying is is there's a big difference between the audience of milos whatever his last name is Douglas. and and um jerome ducharme you know the yeah. two different repertoires uh neither is better neither is worse but they're just different you also have to know as a player like i you know you're talking about i love that you mentioned thinking about what a concert concert promoter will see in your program because okay. as a player you know spraying and praying emails is great but like you also need to think about who are you 
pitching to and what are their priorities in their community and their organization, right? So like mm -hmm. Nathan and I did a tour of all new Canadian works in in Ontario. We played a bunch of small cities and small towns, but part of the reason we were successful, I think, is because we thought about including in the in the pitch, like this is how we're going to make this program understandable and enjoyable to your audience. This is why it's relevant to them, Canadian music, etc. Um, and here are some examples of pieces which, you know, are still approachable. And so it's also a question of like how, yeah, who are you sending these things to? You have to pick your audience a little bit in terms of promoters also, but also how do you pitch it to show that it's, you know, it is understandable and relevant to them in some way. I guess it's easier <laughs> said than done, but you know, it's important to think about who your audience is, not just for the players, but also who's going to help you or not just the audience, but who's going to help you reach the audience. So. And a hundred percent. And the, and the other thing that is, um, no matter what you're playing, if it's good and you're selling it artistically, it's going to get a, a better response than something you're not passionate about. Yeah. And, sure. and there are some promoter, uh, well, I don't, I don't even want to say promoters. There, there are some artistic directors that I'm sure you can contact and you have a much bigger in with them now because they went, Hey, you showed up, you sold the audience on this. They enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether that was new Canadian music or that was Spanish romance, either way, like both are, both are fine. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And it is, and it's also about, you know, the materials you send, right? Like does your artistic profile online or the materials you send them like recordings show your identity as an artist and sell it as like, here's a whole package, you know, I'm this yeah. person. I love playing this. You can see just from the materials I send to you that like what I do is like genuinely in this, you know? So, and then mm -hmm. if they don't like it, maybe they're not the right promoter for you anyways, right? Like maybe they're not the right presenter for that, for what you, yeah, like what I, you're presenting, I'm, right? I'm, so. I, I'm not sure how much experience you've done with, uh, uh, outside of this, uh, avenue for, for promotion or, or concert programming. But, uh, I ran the email account for the Ottawa Guitar Society for a couple of years. <laughs> probably got so right? many like pitches. <laughs> there, are, there are so many, hi, society. My name is right. Fred. I play guitar good and it's not written well. They send you 10 videos and I guarantee you, whether it's an email administrator or you're sending that to an artistic director or a president of a society, they're not going to read that email <laughs> it, when it, when it's put that way. And then it, it chances are the, the videos also suck. Yeah. I mean, like, I guess, I, I, you know, there's, a, I, I know a few artistic directors who I've had conversations about this. Some of them have posted about it online, but like, it's sort of the like, dear sir or dear sir or madam thing like it's the worst also when the artistic director is a woman and they're like dear sir blah blah blah, blah. and you're like <laughs> you well, know, but, well like uh, but like just look up the I, name of the person like it's not that hard like I, I know it takes extra time but you're better off sending 10 emails in a day instead of 40 if those 10 emails you get the name of the person and like mm -hmm. you craft the email specifically to be like your organization is all about this and i can offer this and you know here's mm -hmm. how i'm relevant to you in some way it, it it's just like put in a little do, effort, you know? Do you know, know what a, a snippet is? No. With like computer work? So you can get these uh, 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 programs where you can copy paste into this and then you can create a short code. So anytime you want to use it, you write this short code and that text comes up. Oh, uh, okay. And the amount of times you get those emails where it's dear and everything's the same. Yeah. It's, it's again, it's the effort thing. Yeah. right we're gonna put all this resource and and time into giving you an opportunity how am i going to be convinced based on your copy paste with wrong information yeah and that you're you're going to present a quality uh um per performance yeah and present a quality performance that's a terrible sentence <laughs> beyond that too like the point i think a lot of people don't think about is it, like your job is not just to play guitar when you show up to that concert, your job is also to interact with the audience, to talk to them after, to be like a nice, interesting person for them to speak to because the society wants their audience to feel like they have engaged with the artist, you know? So, well, I, it, yes, but it, you can, you can say that in fewer words. Your job is that the, to produce, uh, it, your job as a performer is that the audience has a good time and they want to come back. Exactly. Right. But it's like, I guess what I'm saying is like by all those all those subtle things you do when you contact the organization, right? Show that yes. you're the kind of person who like when their audience meets you, they're gonna be like, 
oh, I can interact with this person. I feel like I'm, you know, I'm having a good time. They're, you know, they're showing that they value me being here and all that stuff. Um, anyways, this is, we've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole and I think we're both ranting, but this, <laughs> this is great. Um, I also, I want to say Yvonne Lim on YouTube asked, Zach, have you ever been accused of being a hedonist for playing what you like? No comment. <laughs> no comment. Okay. And uh, Halim says, hello, Michael. Hello, Zach. Thanks again for a new live. Thanks, Halim. Thanks for being here. It's nice to see you again. He was here last week with Nathan. Um, and Samuel Lodosh Page says hi to Zach. So. Bonjour. Bonjour. Um, okay. Well, let's listen to some of your playing, actually, Zach, if that's okay. We have some little videos. Do you want to show the, the Brindle or the Juan Soroche piece? Doesn't matter. Okay, let's do the Juan Soroche piece. I actually don't know who this composer is, so can you? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> when the first time I came to Alicante, David Russell played this as an encore, and because of that, it's not in the program. You don't know the composer's name. You don't any of any of that stuff. So uh, I just fell in love with the tune, and I I only found the sheet music three weeks ago or something like that. Wow. So I, was it yesterday? A day or two ago? I, uh, I just felt like recording it. Nice. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let's listen to this. What's the title of the piece again? Sorry. I just have to. So it. it's uh, Romanza by Juan Sorroche, okay. who's a Puerto Rican guitarist composer. Cool. All righty. Let's give this a listen. Wonderful. Very nice, Zach. Gracias. Yes. I was totally listening to that whole thing. I wasn't chatting with you that whole time. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. Uh, Samuel says, is that a new slash old guitar? Where's the Hillhorst? 
Uh, that's my Mayu guitar. Oh. Uh, so I, I got a Patrick Mayu guitar, and I, th I think it was like 2010. Okay. So um, it's a, my, my sweet little guitar, and I thought it was appropriate for that piece. Nice. And Ivan Lim says that was very nice. And Iona Gandrubur says nice feeling and great piece. Nice to see you, Iona. Iona. Um, it's nice to have her here. Uh, she's a uh, she's from Montreal, right? Yeah, she was on the show too. Um, a little. Oh, okay. Ago. Yes. 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 Yeah. I remember seeing her at a, a Yellow Desiderio concert. Nice. Yeah. I yeah. think I never met Ioana at the Montreal Festival, but she was a judge when I was playing one time. Okay. There, so, and then I met her later. Uh, anyways, yeah. But that's kind of where I first encountered her. Um. Samuel says, oh, Mayu, yeah, I remember. You had this one at Domain. Oh, Domain Forge. You're a Domain Forge grad, too. Do you graduate, though, or graduate. do you just experience I mean, it? You, you graduate when you uh, go to the Depanair enough times, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Domain Forge. Yes. Um, yes, Philippe is leaving a long comment about Latin American composers. Okay, I sorry, Philippe, I'm not going to read that whole thing. But Zach, wait, wait, one second. I, we we have to stop here for a second. Samuel, I don't think we were ever at Domaine Forge together. I think he started going the year after I stopped. Ah, uh, Samuel. So I think. Okay. I think. Well, the <laughs> controversy. 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 Were you at Domain at the same time? And he says, and have a poutine by the road. Oh, man, the poutine by the road. That was so good. Yeah. And Halim says, very beautiful piece. Thank you. Um, anyhow, sorry. So I was on, one thing I wanted to ask you, Zach, um, before we get derailed by comments, is um, how did you, like, so you, you came to Alicante and you did the program there. And mm -hmm. you obviously learned the language, right? Because you now live in Spain um i didn't learn it at that time so what what happened was a lot of elements of that program are bilingual and i was living in a in the dormitory and the most of the native spanish speakers wanted to practice english so we would just speak english in the in the in the house uh to the detriment of me learning spanish i may add uh but then afterwards i i traveled a, just like a month I traveled around Spain and whatnot. And then the English was gone. So we we had done some English, uh, some Spanish classes, but uh, like, you know, European language grading systems, mm -hmm. like I was doing A1 Spanish. So okay. it, it's okay. not enough to survive. And then when I eventually, when I moved back to Spain, I looked at my notes and it took like 30 minutes to catch up from, <laughs> from the, the classes we took to like new information. Wow, okay. <laughs> so it wasn't, we I, 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 we, we didn't study too much, but uh, what, what happened was I moved back to Canada afterwards for two, two and a half years. Okay. I started taking classes with uh, Rémi Boucher in Quebec City. Cool. And then I, I was also working at a hotel just to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And I would speak English, French and Spanish there just I was the only one on the on the desk that could speak Spanish a bit, mm -hmm. uh, but when I when I moved back to Spain, that's when it was like, hey, you're gotta on your own. It. Got to got to learn it. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, Ioana says the two voices are still out of balance. Mike, you're much softer still. I turned my mic up since that. Ioana, please tell me if it's okay now. I shouldn't be clipping yet, but tell me. And uh, Ian says the poutine place burned down last summer. Oh no. Yeah, if that's I don't, true. I don't remember that, but that's so sad. I'm sure true. it was delicious. Okay, sorry. I back guess to... I, sorry. Yeah, I guess now's now's the appropriate time to tell everyone that like contractually your mic had to be like 40% lower than mine. Yeah, that was part of the deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're trying to make Zach seem more like he has a bigger presence and so Yes. Yeah, that was yes. the whole point, but you you all of you <laughs> kind have of a... Have ruined sort it. of a big deal. <laughs> yeah, sort, sort of a big deal. deal. Um, yeah. Oh, and Ioana says it's better now. Good. Thank you. In, okay. in all seriousness, thank you, Ioana. That helps a lot. Um, okay. Well, poutine place is burned down. That's really tra tragic if that's true. Um, I guess making too many fries at once, right? Um, <laughs> shouldn't joke about things like that. Uh, but back to your story. The, so, okay. So you went back to Canada, then you came back to Spain, and then you really had to learn Spanish. Uh, mm -hmm. what was that like moving to Spain? What were the sort of, what was the sort of process and how do you feel about living there now? And, you know, well, what, what happened was it, it was kind of one of those, uh, 
one door closes another one opens kind of situation. So I, the, there are some budget cuts in Ottawa with the school system and I had started working uh, various teaching jobs and whatnot in Ottawa and they were, they were coming to an end. And I said, you know, if there's a time to try to move abroad, now would, now would be the time. Yeah. So I, I did that. I found like a, a, what's called the youth mobility visa. So anyone right. watching that's interested in, in kind of going abroad, uh, depending on the country you want to go to, uh, your, your, your government might have an agreement with their government about uh, people just moving for no particular reason, but giving all access to residency for, for a year or two. That's what I used when I first came here too, before I got mm -hmm. to school. Then I did a degree so that I could stay, which is why I have a second master's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So then, uh, so I did that and uh, I didn't really come with a plan. My, it, it, it might sound kind of lazy in terms of planning, but uh, creating a, a wide, ob you can really create a wide objective from this. My real goal was just to start making euros. That okay. was it. That was my only concern. That's um, for the non-Canadians uh, tuning in. The the Canadian to Europe to the Canadian dollar to euro exchange rate is not favorable. So you will burn through cash really quick. Yeah. No matter how much you save. So that was just my priority, and uh, I got I got lucky. I just started gigging pretty much right right away, and then I had a couple English students here and there, and and that was it. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm um, starting to pay off my student loan, my Canadian student loan now. The euro to Canadian conversion is making me very happy because <laughs> yes. I have to send a I, lot less money a monthly to my account <laughs> in Canada. Yeah, I, I, uh, I got this job and it was paying in American dollars, and every month I'm like, oh, I only made this much, and then it would convert, and I go, Whoa! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Money. <laughs> yeah, it's it's true. Um, yeah, so the youth mobility visa I did too, and I should clarify, I didn't go to school just to get a residence permit. I also really wanted to study with Carlo Maracione, and that was one of the easiest ways to get consistent lessons with him too, was to do a second mm -hmm. degree. So it was actually the perfect situation. I was very lucky in the sense that Carlo was willing to take me on. I passed the mm -hmm. audition, and it allowed me to stay, because the, I mean, the youth mobility visa is different in every country. Like, um, my... Uh, fiance Jessica moved to Germany on the youth mobility visa, which you could extend for several years. But here in the Netherlands, you could only use it for one year. And then you would mm -hmm. have to get some other kind of residence permit, mm -hmm. which is why I part of part of why I went to school. So yeah, it's different for every country. But um, yeah, it's interesting having that experience of, you know, having to learn the language start from scratch. I worked at like night shifts at a warehouse when I first showed up here, while I was mm -hmm. like developing my Dutch, I, I kind of like you know, a lot of people move to the Netherlands and don't learn English or don't, sorry, don't learn Dutch because you can use English here. But like, mm -hmm. you know, as well as me, like if you want to network and sort of like get into circles where you can find work, especially as a freelance artist, it really helps to speak some of the language because it shows like that basic level of like wanting to engage with the culture and understand the culture to some extent and mm -hmm. to partake in it, you know. Also, learning a language is awesome, so I don't see the downside of doing it, you know, uh, <laughs> personally. So, yeah, it's just, it's interesting. It's 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 a different experience for sure, but um, I found it incredibly helpful once I could at least use it at a basic level for teaching and for, you know, gigging and everything. Um, you know, I'm still trying mm -hmm. to improve my Dutch, but at least I can can get by in a work situation now with it, so. There, there's, a, there's a large expat community in Spain, and... I don't, I don't, the discrimination works both ways because a lot of them come here going, I can get by on English. There's no need to speak Spanish. Yeah. It, and that, then, yeah. and then the Spanish people are going like those English people show up and they don't learn Spanish. What are they doing here? Kind of yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Both, both perspectives are, are kind of dumb. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh, but it, 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 it certainly opens more doors for you whether it's employment, whether it's musical opportunities or, or just to be able to walk up to someone and say, Hey man, like, how's it going? And have a conversation Yeah. in whatever language. I also just feel like, I don't know if you move here, especially as a student, like in, in my case and, and maybe your case too, a student or you weren't a student per se, but like moving somewhere, especially in a situation where like, you're not like fleeing a terrible situation or something. It's kind of like, why would you not like just like learn some of it at least and and try mm -hmm. it's just i don't know yeah i guess yeah 
uh samuel says same happening in montreal french and english yeah for sure i think if i moved to montreal i would have i would have definitely made an effort to try to move Fran learn french too because i'm from alberta so you know <laughs> it's like my french yeah. is non-existent basically but uh, so quebec has a real interesting uh dilemma because the the um the demographic of native francophone with no english it's a it's actually a small minority now you've got to right. go to towns outside of towns outside of quebec city and in these areas but more and more people are being raised bilingual and like these little english patches are popping up so montreal actually has a as a rather big population of people that don't speak any french huh yeah uh and and oddly enough when you look at canadian language demographics i think like within the next however many years chinese will be the second most sp spoken language after english in mm -hmm. canada yeah yeah yeah, yeah I mean, th things change but like yeah again it's just like i i don't understand the i mean I, it is a lot of work to learn a language it's true but if you're living somewhere like it just it improves your mm -hmm. life so much in so many ways so many small ways you don't necessarily think of yeah and um and also it's just it's good for your brain it's good for yourself you know you learn a lot about you know the, the the percentage of uh people with alzheimer's who are bilingual compared to unilingual it's it's like night and day yeah and it also it also slows the effect of uh mental uh de degradation or, or mental degradation, uh, yeah, yeah. degradation over in in adults so yeah and and here's you know you like so part of the other story is one of my one of my jobs was just doing esl english second language stuff here Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's the same in, in, in the Netherlands. It, 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 maybe I could, I don't have the memory to think if it was uh, resonated with me when I was in French classes growing up, but so many people are afraid to make a mistake. Yeah. So many people, so but, many people. And, and the, the, the best opportunities to learn are from errors. And also people are, okay, I guess it depends where you are. I can't speak for everywhere, but here at least people are so happy when you try, you know, because like, I think mm -hmm. so many, so many expats here just don't try. Mm -hmm. So I think when you try Dutch people are like really, you know, happy. And actually sometimes they're a little too helpful with like switching to English because their English is so good. And I mm -hmm. have to kind of be like, no, I want to try, you know, like when I call like the, you know, phone company, I try to speaking Dutch yeah. for, for as long I, I tell them I have this spiel I'm like look my Dutch isn't good especially for this conversation normally I only teach guitar in Dutch so I'm gonna try and when I don't have the vocabulary I'm gonna switch okay and they're always like great and they're like you know super supportive so I have so few experiences of people not being like kind and gracious about it mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the same for you but yeah yeah well um I don't know I just I it, it, it's once again it's it's easier to build that connection if 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 you just go with it so i if someone wants to speak english with me and i feel like they're being genuine because they want to improve their english or something i will speak english with them right but, but uh because they're probably not watching this if i can tell they're not genuine in why they want to do it and they're really struggling and it's just awkward I will gradually transition the conversation into full Spanish. They right. just don't realize. I'm just not going to do it right away, but yeah, it will yeah. become that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that happens with me with some Dutch people. When I get out, way out of my depth in a conversation, it's like <laughs> it's hindering the communication, right? There's like a point mm -hmm. where, you know, you got to switch. Um, Ioana says, especially in the Netherlands, they have good English. Yeah, very good English. And Ian Brukelaar, which is a very good Dutch name. Uh, yeah. Ian says, I found in Spain they're super receptive and patient with you trying to speak in Spanish. Oh, that's good um yeah but you know music is just another language right so this is my other right? thing is like if you're a musician you're already learning a language like you've already learned a second language so what's a third you know it's fine <laughs> well well honestly um once you've got the the second one down the rest are easy so yeah i can i can more or less understand some french i'm, I'm nowhere near native with french in, in terms of listening but uh, like a year and a half or two years ago, I actually started taking French classes. And because my Spanish had, had uh, gotten so much better, I was able to use this Spanish grammar, apply it to French and my French just, it, it got so much better, so much more quickly because I was able to use 
my the, the Spanish part of my brain. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It depends on the language. I mean, like now that I've learned Dutch and Jessica learned German because she moved to Berlin when I moved to the Netherlands because she was working with a teacher there. And um, like, you know, when she speaks German to anyone else, I can sort of follow much easier now that I know Dutch because the languages have so many similarities, yeah. right? So, mm -hmm. um, Philippe says Spanish and French is hard to learn. Tried that too. And languages like German slash Dutch are closer to English, which makes it a bit easier to learn. I suppose. I mean, the problem with German and Dutch is that the grammar is so different than English, like the order of the words and stuff. Like, actually, yeah, I don't have a hard time with Dutch vocabulary because of the similarities to English, but like putting the words in the right order, I'm just like always lost. Mm -hmm. um, not always but lost, you make but... the, you make those mistakes that so you get corrected yeah. you learn from them exactly and that's it exactly that's it. um let's move on zach to one of our favorite segments which is the repertoire listening test are you ready for this okay <laughs> um our this listen is... yeah our listeners okay. might know this we're gonna make zach listen to some recordings and we're going to get him to guess the piece composer and performer and or performer and I'll help you. I give a lot of hints. I mean, if you've watched okay. the show, you know you know that I give a lot of hints. So don't worry too, too much. I'm just going to make sure I've shared my audio through Zoom. Uh, and people in the chat, please guess away. But don't, uh, maybe Zach, don't watch the chat for this portion. Um, okay, so we're going to start with some easier ones. And then we're going to move to more tricky ones. So we're gonna start Has with... anyone ever put on the that app that uh, uh Shazam? The music? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Maybe, <laughs> okay. maybe, maybe they never told me. Who knows? Um, okay. Okay. So, can you guess who the who this player is, the composer is, or the piece is? So it's Russell. Yeah. And it's it's the uh, Bach arrangement that. Uh, yeah. Like wow. 838 Overture or something like that? 830, and what instrument is it is originally for? It's a something partita? Piano. Keyboard partita, yes. Keyboard, very yeah. Very good. Okay, three out of three. Easy. Wait, wow. wait, 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 wait. Who's the, who, I forget, why am I forgetting? Who arranged the, it? Uh, Bonus point. You can get, you can get I, extra I, points. It's in my head. It's, it's this German guy. Yeah, yeah. It's the German guitarist who arranged it. It's not with a T, though. Oh, man. No, it's with a K. Is associated with the Koblenz Festival. Thomas. No, no, not Thomas Kirchhoff. Uh, Hans. No, not Hans. But his first name does start with H. You're getting closer. It's warmer. It's it's Hubert Kappel. Okay. <laughs> I, I think I gave a good description of him. Yeah, you get, okay, I'll give you half a point. So 3.5 out of 3. Very good. Um, Ioana says, I started to learn Spanish because so many guitarists in festivals will speak German and other... And then she wrote Capel at the end. There we go. She got. Yeah, well, advice. actually, speaking of David Russell, he, he gave that piece of advice. He goes, as a, as a classical guitar player, you should really either speak English and or Spanish because wherever you go in the world, if you go to Japan... A lot of the guitar, classical and flamenco guitar players there, they'll learn Spanish. And if you can't speak Japanese, you're just going to end up speaking Spanish to them. Yeah. And you can communicate and you, you build that. So. Yeah, that, that actually, Spanish is the next language I kind of want to give a crack at, honestly. Um, because I, I think. Well, I'm not hablamos en español si quieres. I'll, por I'll, resto, ¿no? I'll call you, Zach. <laughs> Okay. We'll chat. Okay. When I once I've had like a few months with like Duolingo, you know, or like memorize yeah. or whatever, yeah, I'll give you a call. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay. okay. Uh, so very good. Three point five out of three on the first one. That was not so hard. Okay. Uh, next one. We're gonna drop the needle in the middle of this one because I think it's too easy. Otherwise. Is it the fantasia? The Arcas one? No, it is a fantasy, but it's not Arcas. No, oh, it's Hungarian fantasy by Hungarian uh, fantasy, yeah, by Meritz, exactly. And this is a Canadian player from Ottawa. Do you want to hear the some like maybe the later section? <laughs> Any idea who it could be? I'll give you three guesses. 
from Ottawa. Yeah, from Ottawa. Can, can I ask you a question first? Sure. I may not answer it. We'll see. Is it a man or a lady? It's a man. From Ottawa. Who you know? Andrew Ma? It's not Andrew Ma. Guess again. Oh, it's Nathan. It's Nathan. Nathan. It's Bredesen. Nathan. Yeah, Nathan Bredesen. Yeah. Playing Hungarian fantasy. There, I was really nice telling you Ottawa. That's like, that's a big hint. Yeah. But I guess Canadian guitarist is a little broad. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay, three out of three. That was easy, right? Okay, next one. <laughs> the Jose it's the Jose Sonata yeah the last movement uh yes and this is also a Canadian guitarist this time from from Vancouver actually I don't think okay he didn't record it it's a pretty new recording so I don't know if you keep up with this guitarist closely but I think it's from last year if I'm not mistaken 2020 Probably not gonna know. Uh, this guitarist is plays... he in a duo with Drew Henderson? Yes, yes. Okay, so it's Michael Cloak. Col Michael Colk. Colk. Yes, Michael Cloak. Yeah. Very good. Not bad. Because I, I forget if sometimes I forget where they where they're located because I think Drew goes all over and but he's yeah. based in Toronto. Is Michael actually based in Vancouver? I said from Vancouver because I know he's from. Okay, because I... I don't I don't. Sorry, Michael, I don't know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know where he lives either. I think he might live in Vancouver and then, or no, he probably lives, I don't know. We'll see, whatever. Um, yeah, Drew, Michael Culkin, yeah, Jose Sonata. He, he has a great, it's a great new CD he released of uh, Sonatas. So, and he has also the Cyril Scott Sonatina on there, which is a super cool piece. Um, anyways, I don't know. What... Everybody check out the CD. It's it's great. You, you, you would have gotten me if you went with that instead of the uh, Jose. Sonata. Yeah, I've done the Cyril Scott Sonatina on here and almost nobody gets it. So I you know I stopped. Uh, I love that piece. So I want I want to play it every week because it's like a great piece. But then nobody knows what it is. So, it's, you know, um, OK, uh, next one. <laughs> So Barrios Danza Paraguay, Paraguana? Paraguaya. Paraguay. Yeah, and the player? I didn't hear enough of it. Okay, I'll play a bit more. Uh, this player, this is from a Naxos collection this player has done of Barrios on on Nexus. There's actually a few CDs, I believe, by this player on Nexus of Barrios. Um, this player is a Turkish player, if that helps. Oh, I, I actually, yeah, Cecil, I, I, I don't know how to say his name. Yeah, Chilil Rafikaya. Yeah, I think that's yeah, his yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's Chilil. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay, I'm giving you too many hints. I'm going to stop with the hints on the players because you've gotten, like, you haven't missed a point yet, and this is, like, it's too easy. Um... I think I just don't know Barrios' music because I never played any, so I thought that piece was like intermediate, but I, I guess not. Um, in terms of recognizing or in terms yeah, of difficulty? In terms ah, of recognizing, okay. yeah, because I, I, okay. we're in the intermediate category now. But, I mean, like organizing uh -huh. this listening test is kind of ridiculous anyways because everybody <laughs> everybody listens to different things, right? Yeah. Um, okay, here we go. No idea. Italian composer. Well, it, it's not Giuliani. No, it's not Giuliani. It's Tedesco. Cap Tedesco, very good. I was about okay. to give it up. Yeah, Tedesco. And... Oh, okay. So that's probably the uh, Tarantella. No, not the Tarantella. It's not quite okay. crazy enough for that. Almost, but it is a dance. Uh, okay, Io yeah. Ioana has it, Tedesco. Jose Cueto has it, Tedesco. Very good, Jose. Very good, Ioana. Um, okay, it's it's from the Variations Through the Centuries. It's the Foxtrot. Ah, okay, okay. Um, and the player, can you guess who the player is from the sound? You want to hear a bit more? I'll play a later section. Is it Vilato? It is Vilato, yeah. Yeah. 
I remember he really. I, I have that CD. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the dances through the centuries okay. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay, so uh, two out of three. Oh, you missed a point. Oh my gosh, Zach, you missed a point. How could you? Um, okay, last one in this section. Then we're on to the last section. Bagatelle, right? Nope. No, but it's Berkeley then. No, it's not Berkeley. It's not Berkeley. Berkeley? It's, not Walt it's not Walton. It's not Berkeley. It's not even from the European continent, this piece. Oh, Ioana has it. Very good, Ioana. She was very good at this game. Because it, it sounds like a, a brain piece. Uh, It's not a brain piece, actually, as far as I know. He might have played it. Although, actually, I don't think Bream played much of this composer, to be honest. It's possible he did. Um, ah, Halim also has it. Halim and Jose and Samuel. Um, composer from the Americas, but not North America. Uh, no, I guess technically North America. Yeah, yeah. Is it Brower? No, it's uh, it's Ponce. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh... <laughs> This comes up with guitar players quite often. I, 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 I'm not a big fan of Ponzi. Ah, uh, okay, okay. There you go. Yeah. You, don't, you don't know the piece then? Nope. Okay, can you guess who the player is from the sound? Barwico? It's not Barwico, no. no. Samuel, Samuel says, tell him it's not Vice. That's funny. Uh... It's um, it's uh, Jude Calperois. Ah, and which piece was that? Sonatina Meridional. Ah, okay. Well, you made your first big stumble, zero out of three. Okay, so in the beginner category, ah. you had nine point five out of nine, so that's pretty good. Whoa. And then in Whoa. the intermediate category, you had five out of nine, so it's not too bad. Okay. Still passing, you know. Super. Uh, Jose says it sounds like a smallman. Exactly, super smallman sound. Jude Cal. Okay, next one. We're now in the advanced category, so you know you can start trembling or whatever. Oh, it's music and memory. Oh my god. Okay, it's not even difficult. Uh, yeah, music and, and memory. And that's probably Marcindia. Yes, it is. And who's the composer? Um. Ooh, maybe I'll get you. No, it starts with an M. Uh, Nicholas Ma. Nicholas Ma. Very good. Three out of three. I Have you ever those. read that score? No, I'm terrified to, but I probably should. I, I, I love the melody that comes in after the cadenza. So I've always been like, yeah, let's read this and, and to play the melody. But then even when you get to that, because it's just madness, then even that melody, like that part is hard to play. And it goes, the, you know what? It's a Mendelssohn quote, isn't it? Yeah. It goes, yeah, these 21 pages, let's, uh, let's learn something else. <laughs> let's learn something else, yeah. And that's only like, what? three minutes into like a 20 minute piece or whatever it is yeah <laughs> it's almost like as bad as nathan sonata anyways um... good good for them for getting through it <laughs> yeah no long pieces are good i i and i nathan if you're listening i love your sonata i'm recording it now you know it's great um but long pieces are they you know picking up a long piece is not something you just do on a whim right so well, well, actually um i know we're in one segment but if we hark back to the previous segment it, yeah. it's also the Pro, not even uh, profit profitability but if you're going to invest all that time into learning 20 minutes of music at the same time if you wanted to learn a, a a full concert of of like the hits or whatnot you're going to take the same amount of time or even shorter learning all of those than you are with getting through the music of memory yeah so if you take that on as a project great for you like that's yeah. great yeah but you got to really want it is the point you know, yeah so and it's got to be really worth and, and, it for some reason. And you need the time to get through it because yeah. you probably you're, you, you don't want to walk in and just kind of shit the bed on that. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Samuel says, ma. Very good. Okay, next one. <laughs> I play this. <laughs> you play this? <laughs> Smith Grindle, um, El yeah. Polifemo de Oro. Yeah. Uh, 
probably Bream. Yeah, it's Bream. <sighs> yeah, okay. I'm, I chose way too easy things for you. Yes. Okay, last one. Let's see if you get this as easily as okay. the rest. It kind of has like a Defia beat kind of to it, but it's not Defia. No, it's not Defia. Not it's Defia. Spanish though. No, actually. No? It's a Russian composer. Oh. Sergei Rudnev. Koshkin. No, you got the first Is name it Koshkin? right though. It's not Koshkin, but you got the first name right. Sergei... Rachmaninoff? Rachmaninoff! Very good. Michael Jones says Koshkin. No, it's not Koshkin, actually. It's a non-guitarist composer. That's why it's in the advanced category. Because uh, <laughs> we don't know other composers, you know? Uh, Rachmaninoff. Yeah. And who's the player? Do you know? Do you want to hear a bit more? I only know, like, one person that's done a Rachmaninoff arrangement, and I don't think it's her. Okay. No, it's not. It's not her. It's a French player. <laughs> Bianco? It's not Bianco. It's a, a very a, a relatively recent GFA winner. That's the last hint I'm giving you. Um, probably not Thibault. Uh, uh, Michael Jones has it. Michael Jones has got the right answer. But don't. Look I forgot the guy's name, but he he won it like uh he he won the year Steven Thierry were in the uh, the semis. I think that's who you're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I don't know his name. Okay, it's Raphael. I can't. Michael Jones says, saying, saying, I can't spell his last name. I can't pronounce his last name. It's Filetre, Filetre, Filetre. I don't know. I don't speak French, so. But Raphael, yeah. There you go. Okay, so you got, oh, but what piece is it? I forgot that. Okay, it's a pre, it's prelude number 10. So, okay, you lost one point on the piece. Prelude in C. <laughs> what key is you, it? No, it's G minor, G minor. <laughs> Do you know that um, trick? I, I was told that like when I started my undergrad, they're like, if if you're ever on a listening test and you don't know what it is, or like you have to you have to name a work by a composer, just say prelude and C. <laughs> I mean, it's more likely to be correct than other names, I guess. Yeah. Um <laughs> Prelude number one. <laughs> oh, Samuel's helping me. Feu a tre. Okay, I don't even know how to. Can someone tell me? Can you look at that, Zach, in this Facebook chat and tell me how I'm supposed to pronounce that? Because I, again, French is hard for me. Okay, so Zach, your final tally is in beginner category, you got 9.5 out of 9. Very good. In intermediate category, you got 5 out of 9. Not so good, but also not terrible. And then in the advanced category, you got 8 out of 9. It's pretty good. Nice. Yeah, you really um... knocked it out of the park. Very nice. Um, yeah, I don't... we. Why don't we just call Samuel? Let's get let's get him. Let's on get this Samuel place. on the show. Samuel, want to join our Zoom chat? <laughs> just uh, he can just be here for to help us pronounce French words and French names. Just chime in whenever you feel. Uh... Yeah. Um, okay, we're gonna listen to your Brindle now. Actually, since we're on the subject. Ah, okay. Brindle. Do you want to tell people about it? Sure. So, um, I'm gonna do a long intro on this one, or a longer intro. Okay. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, Reginald Smith Brindle was an English composer. He wrote, um, he's actually more famous for his academic writing than he is some of his pieces. Mm -hmm. And if, if anyone studied composition or serial, serial composition, I think he, he's written what is considered the, the kind of the, the industry standard in um, serial uh, textbooks for serial composition. Oh. So many, many non-guitar players and instrumentalists know him through, through that textbook as opposed to his music. Um, the, the piece that you played before, El Polifemo de Oro, I think it's considered to be one of, if not the first complete serial pieces for guitar, or at least to feature a tone row. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's 100% true. I just I remember hearing that somewhere. Uh, and anyway, so my, my teacher from my undergrad, a guy named Stephen Rollins, he uh, went in his, younger days, he, he traveled Europe a bit and he he studied in Compostela with uh, Jose Tomas. And then he also took classes with John Mills in the, and I think he, John Mills used to do classes somewhere in the Netherlands. Huh. There, there was a summer thing or, or whatnot. 
And so John Mills is very good friends with uh, Smith Brindle. And uh, he, I, I guess Steve was able to go play the El Polifemo de Oro for Smith Brindle and they, they, got on, they got on really well. So I think the, the story was when Steve got back from his travels, there was just like a stack of sheet music waiting on his door that Smith Brindle mailed him. And he found this piece in here. So this is the Sonatina Fior Fiorentina. Uh, I worked on this during my undergrad with with Steve, and it's it's um, it's one of those pieces like what's once it's in your finger, even if you stop playing it for many years, you look at the score and it's just like oh yeah, yeah. So um, I, I this was shot kind of a couple weeks into the pandemic, and I just what I was mentioning before with having no solo repertoire. I felt like picking this piece up again. So I, I actually just relearned it the night before shooting this and cool. just decided to give it a go. Nice. Yeah. And like, actually, I want to chat more about, you know, doing stuff online during the pandemic after. But let's listen to the Smith Brindle piece. I had never heard it before. So it's, it's a little gem, it seems like. Mm -hmm. So let's give it a listen. And people who have questions, since there's quite a few in the chat now, please bring them after the recording.
Very nice. Very cool, Zach. We're back. Yeah. Awesome. Super duper. Super, super duper. Um, yeah, Samuel yeah. says so much textures. He was also asking, do you guys know Xenomon Black Widow? Cool piece too. Never heard of this piece. No idea. No, never heard of it. Um, yeah. So, okay. You were saying actually to me before the show and then just now before this, that you recorded this shortly after the pandemic hit, right? Um, yeah. And what was it like for you switching to an online life slash quarantine life? How do you view it as a guitarist? Where are we? At? I, um, <clears throat> I, I transitioned very, very seamlessly into it because I, uh, I primarily worked online already. And I wasn't practicing as much guitar as I wanted to. So I go, oh, great. I can work still and then go play guitar with the rest of my day. Awesome. <laughs> nice. So I, I know, uh, it's really positive. And I know a lot of people have struggled. And, and there's been a lot of uh, um, uh, kind of mental awareness over the past year or like year and a month. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I was very fortunate that I... Uh, I settled into it really kind of positively. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. Mark is asking, have either of you ever tried reaching out of RSB's Guitar Cosmos? I have no idea what that is. Original Smith Brindle's Guitar Cosmos? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think those are um, those are more beginner pieces. I think he, he um, kind of like Roland Jans in, in a sense where a lot of these composers, they, they, they start out with writing big, complex pieces, and then they kind of realize that the... I, well, the be beginner repertoire isn't as strong as as it should be. So then they start writing pieces for lower levels. Mm. And I, I, if I, I, I might be talking out of my ass here, but I think a lot of Smith Brindle stuff, kind of after the Polifemo de Oro and and a couple other works, I think a lot of his pieces were more aimed at uh, um, entry level repertoire as opposed to big complex oh. pieces. Cool. That's awesome. I mean, I'm always thrilled when I find that kind of thing as a teacher because, you know, there's so many great there's so many great composers I want to expose my students to playing that just mm -hmm. have only like super difficult works like Tedesco or something, you know, and it's like... Yeah, like, do, do you know, um, uh, Clay Jean? Uh, yeah. Francois Clay Jean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's another, he's another guy, right? He has the um, tombeau pour, uh, pour le, le dernier jeu, like the, the one with the boom, and like the it's about someone getting the guillotine and then he's got like this other arabesque that he wrote for david russell and then to my knowledge pretty much everything after has always been more beginner and intermediate pieces yeah that's great mm -hmm. um mark says it's a reflection of bartok's microcosmos so it's a bartok thing i guess Cool. Um, Samuel Laroche-Page says a lot of women composers for students, Stachek and Linneman. I know the Stachek stuff. I use some of it for my students, actually, which is great. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard I of the Linneman Samuel's stuff. Doing a, Samuel's doing a great job of getting little arrangements going, too. Nice. Um, Mark says it's basically beginning serial, serial music. It's actually awesome, but maybe more in, oriented towards academics. I mean, some students are into like sort of more adventurous harmony from a, from the get-go you know not all of them but some mm -hmm. some people gravitate towards that pretty quickly so can i can i pivot and uh yes of course throw, throw, throw out this question to you so i i have a bit of a theory when you look at the history of music and you can say transitioning from the renaissance through to the baroque and classic classical eras it was all about patronage yeah right as you tra as we go from late classical through romantic era, it's more you know the artist, mm -hmm. quote unquote, and you get into the sense of uh, um, I don't want to say self-employed, but people actually charging regular people for classes and not the aristocratic aristocratic patronage or church patronage. I yeah. think, and and this is something I'm throwing out there now is that at the turn of the 20th century with the second Viennese school, this enters the, the phase of academia, academic music. Um, I love the, the, the work of uh, Webern, for, for example, some Berg, uh, a lot of Schoenberg, but I also in, understand a thousand percent that it's not necessarily accessible 
Yeah. But when your when your job isn't to write church music and your job isn't to just play virtuoso music, but your job is to kind of research and and teach theory, it moves the dial in a different direction. Mm-hmm. And when and then you also add in the fact that the recording technology in the 20th century uh and you can kind of see how classical music kind of went the academic route whereas all these other musics were were able to come in and just kind of define what is popular music and and uh what people listen to yeah definitely i well i've always struggled with this because how much is has classical music ever really been like what most people listen to i guess at some points it was more so than now that's fair um, but I, but I just don't, I don't know, I don't know enough about, like, people's listening habits in, like, the 19th century to know, like, I guess, like, Liszt and Paganini were rock stars, you know, so. Yeah, I, because uh, arguably, like, Telemann, Handel, they had reputations. No one yeah. really knew who Bach was, aside from Weiss and a couple other people. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, all virtually all Renaissance music was for the king pub music that was adapted for church settings right yeah at, at least in terms of renaissance music that we still have that was written down it was yeah mm-hmm. yeah anyways I, I thought about that a couple of weeks ago and i like threw that idea out to a class and they're like yeah it but makes, i think they were also just it makes they sense. were also just going yeah, they were also just going, yeah, because I don't think they knew what I was talking about. So. <laughs> right, because it was like so off on your own, like that. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it makes intuitive sense to me. Uh, not that that makes it true or not, but it makes sense to me. What I find interesting, too, is now we're in this situation where you have this sort of academic class of musicians. And then you mm-hmm. have all of us who graduate and don't necessarily get in those positions. And what do we do? Like, where do you know what who do we appeal to how do we did, do, did you ever watch the show archer no oh wait i've seen a few episodes but no so there, there's one episode where there's like an archie um anthropologist and archer's like what do anthropo what are you doing and he goes the guy's like david cross is doing the voice and he goes well i'm i'm studying and teaching others wait so your job is to also train people who aren't going to end up with jobs <laughs> basically yeah yeah, um, uh, I've I've actually heard some people define it as um, we're really uh, um, tour guides in a museum yeah. in terms of when you're playing classical music. Yeah, because it's it's a lot of some more than others, but it's historical research, it's historical practices, adapting it, deciding what you want to do with it, and that and, being uh, said, there is the whole like new music thing, and to an extent, to an extent, as as much as people like to sort of uh how do i use a nice term uh poo poo that uh <laughs> that sort of music for for like playing for people um you know we like I, I don't know my experience has been that we're working with composers and playing in like contemporary new music settings with organizations who are pushing that it's like there's almost more opportunities in some ways um i don't know i, I guess i guess it, i guess it's pretty situation specific but yeah and and it, it... And to kind of uh, thrash a bit on the the grant system, yeah. a lot of that is derived from grant systems. Well, who can write a paper about why this is a good idea? Right, exactly. Regardless of how the piece sounds. <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why I always try when I'm when I'm doing new music to make sure that it's something that like I could take to any audience and like present in a way that's like accessible and understandable. Which a lot of it is, and I think that that's the unfortunate thing that the the bias that I don't like that people have towards new music is that it's not approachable. And the problem is that there is music, new music that's approachable and there's ways to make it approachable. It's that a lot of people don't bother to do those things. I think that's more of an issue. I, pretty much in all of my experience, it's both as a performer as an, or as an audience member, whenever someone's going to present something weird or different, mm-hmm. if they explain it, the, no matter what you end up doing, the, the audience is more receptive to it. But if you just don't say anything you just go into it then that's when you lose the the audience yeah i think on any type of music honestly especially when it comes to classical music you know mm-hmm. um ben diamond says hey hey ben how's it going you weren't here for your first comment he always gets the first comment but today he wasn't he wasn't wasn't on time um halim is asking how do you find teaching online do you want to address that quickly 
Um, well, it's different. So I'm uh, I'm I'm teaching online and and for one thing, and I'm a, a substitute in a local conservatory here. So even there, even as a substitute, and I, I realize that we're like an oh, an hour and twenty minutes into this, and no one from the conservatory is going to be watching, let alone understanding this conversation because everyone there is Spanish. But uh, there there are procedures in place. Like you you aren't supposed to be within a certain distance of a student. Mm -hmm. It's not like you can walk up and touch their hands and everything like we would yeah. normally do to to move things. Um, I don't know. You you just adapt to it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's all communication based and understanding the resource. Like with a with a video, it's much easier to say, "Hey, here's what I sh what I'm doing. Pause the video if you want. Rewatch it ten times. Do what you need to do to take the information and and check to make sure your hands are doing the same thing." Yeah, I mean, I get my students to record themselves sometimes, and then we watch the video together on Zoom with screen mm -hmm. sharing and that's very powerful because then i can pause the video with my mouse be like see what's happening here like and they notice things mm -hmm. that they wouldn't notice if they didn't watch it with me so yeah anyway yeah i'm a, I'm a i'm a big 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 fan of telling everybody to just practice in front of a mirror yeah or with the camera <laughs> with the camera is good but uh, i think a lot of people are afraid of cameras i'm 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 not terribly comfortable in front of cameras mm -hmm when it is when I'm playing, but I sit in front of a mirror every day and my technique has changed completely over the past couple of years just because I'm able to do, oh, hey, I need to move this. Yeah. yeah. Um, Halim says, and does not work for beginners. I don't really agree with that. It really depends on the beginner, I think. It's, it's harder with kids, but even then, I think that online can work for beginners in, depending on the circumstance. Mm -hmm. and, depend, and depending on the uh, teacher and the technology and depending on the parents willingness to invest in good technology and a good setup and all that kind of thing so uh well te all of that is true but it's also the material that you're trying to teach yeah so if you've if you've if you're trying to do Aaron sheer exercise one that might not work because it's set up it's it's 50 plus years of uh in-person classes but if you've taken uh if you're aware of the situation and what works and what doesn't work then you can maybe go to exercise five mm -hmm. instead of number one and and yeah go with yeah. that samuel is saying sure it can parents support i think that's the biggest thing i mean if it's an adult online can totally work if it's a kid if the parents are supportive and helpful with the online lessons mm -hmm. thing, it makes all the difference for me mm -hmm. so but that but obviously i understand in a pandemic it's hard having kids at home and your work at home and everything so i don't really blame parents who struggle with that and i don't really expect too much from parents in that situation but it, it their you know their support means the world honestly for the kid um mm -hmm. sorry Ioana also said i wanted to address this she says this makes teaching for me so hard and not seeing students online also tricky i would imagine that would be very hard Ioana, because um Ioana's blind so she can't you know necessarily see a, on the video what a student is doing and mm -hmm. the audio, the uh, this, yeah, actually I actually hadn't thought about that. That would be really hard because so many clues we I get now are from sight, honestly, because of connection problems and microphone problems and not everybody has a good mic and everything. Sometimes I'm not even really listening all the time to the student because the audio is such a problem, but I can see what needs to be fixed. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that would make a big difference. I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm just spitballing here, but perhaps the advantage she has in this moment would be just listening for tension. Right. Because yeah. whether 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 or not you can see the screen or, or listen to the audio, really, it's not the best audio in the world. You can kind of still get a sense of when things don't sound good. Yeah, when they're tense and that kind of thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would imagine that recording would be even more. Maybe you can tell us, Yona, what your experience has been, but maybe the the recording, having them record before and then listening back would make a difference because then there's no chance of lag or like degradation from mm -hmm. Zoom, you know. So when I actually when I actually want to hear a student sound, I ask them to record before the lesson, whatever they're playing, so we can listen. Makes sense. Yeah, it makes yeah. a big difference. But yeah, but that would be challenging. Um, oh my goodness, Ben, it's such a long comment, Ben. I'm gonna so not, not only so many genuine like I know nothing about changes by LA. Okay, I'm sorry, Ben. This is too long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um okay i think yeah okay ioana says recording before beforehand is the key indeed i would i would imagine so um mm -hmm. okay but to pivot back to the pandemic and online stuff in general 
uh, something you were saying to me before the show, which maybe we can address before we wrap up is like, do you have tips and ideas for people to how to approach releasing content online? What are different ways to do it? What should they be looking at? Should they be caring a lot about analytics? What are, what are some, because you have a little bit of experience in this area. Yeah, so it, it all comes down to, and, and our, our pre-conclusion is going to be the, the same thing as the uh, the theme here, but it all comes down to what your what's your goal with And your goal might be different than my goal. My goal might be much different than someone else's goal. So analytics are arguably the only thing that are important. Mm -hmm. And if your goal is to make money from YouTube or, or, or whatnot, Good luck. Your goal is your your well. Good luck, but it, it's also like you know. I was I was pre thinking this this topic, and I came up. I, I think I figured out YouTube, and I think I figured out Instagram, and what what the point is of a lot of people that I don't want to say overshare, but a lot of guitar players out there that are post like posting co content two three times a week. I think the analogy is that it's kind of it's kind of like Tinder. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm with you here. The object, the main objective is of Tinder is to get off of Tinder. Yeah. Right. right. To, to have a relationship or something. Well, maybe not. Or to have an experience, well, whatever it is. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Again, whatever your objective is might be different than my objective with Tinder. Right. But the thing, the th thing that I'm thinking of is more that, um, and we'd have to ask some of these people, but I would think the the amount of time people spend on on instagram videos or youtube videos uh it's it's net loss you're most yep. likely not going to make that money back 100 percent. unless you're like a... unless you're like someone who has such amazing content and such a huge following like i don't know maybe maybe brandon Acker or someone like that someone who is in the hundreds of thousands of views or something right you're but yeah you're... yeah but but we can also apply this to those people and say their goal is, of course, to get great out of analytics, uh, um, get people indoctrinated into the circle of content. So they're, they're not watching one video, they're watching five. But the other thing, and, and here's my Tinder analogy, I think it's all about Patreon. And I think it's all about uh, um, paid services. Yeah. So watch this YouTube video. If you like it, click on my Patreon. If you watch this Instagram video, if you like it, click on my Patreon. From that point of view, I kind of understand the the hours to loss perspective or ratio, whatever you want to call it. Um, and and even like um, Gorhan, I, I don't know what her Gohar? name is. Gohar, Gohar, Gohar. Yeah, yeah, yeah like Fardanian. Yeah, she, she's got like thirty or forty thousand followers, right? Yeah. So it, she like crowdfunded a CD based on that, and I was also thinking. You know, if she ends up selling 500 more CDs or a thousand more CDs because of like the Instagram content, then it's clearly profitable in right. many ways for her. I mean, this is what we but... were talking about before, <laughs> like that, you know, f for me at least, it's kind of like a glorified CV in a way, you know, like it, it's, it's, I know that the main ways I'm going to make money, at least at this point in my career are teaching and performing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just... Again, it's another way to boost those things. I, I don't know. It's it. I still don't see it as a viable way to make money in and of itself, right? Well, well, you hope, you hope, because um, there's really no guarantee on on any of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and please correct me on this, people in the chat, or if you know someone who knows a guy, but I I'm not a hundred percent sure that Instagram videos solely lead to new concert opportunities. No, not solely, definitely not solely. Yeah. And and the chances are the 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 Gorhans and, and even like Evan to an extent. Evan Toucher, yeah. I'm sure a lot of their concerts and a lot of the things that are profitable for them are because they do X, Y, and Z in addition to the Instagram or the, the, for sure. the content. I mean, but it's, it's, it's unfortunately, and this is what I keep telling people this too, when they complain about social media, I'm like, look, the problem is at this point, it's kind of a necessity, sort of like mm -hmm. in my, in my view, sort of like being on Spotify. Honestly, I think that it sort of is in a way, um, mm -hmm. not in, maybe not entirely. I'm sure you can have a career without being on Spotify. It's possible. Some people are doing it, but Taylor Swift wasn't on Spotify for a while. Uh, okay. 
well. She took, that was more of a licensing issue. Okay. She wanted more money. Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, but uh, fair enough. But my point <laughs> is like, it, it's sort of like none of these things is sufficient, but they are all to some extent necessary. And like, I right. guess my thing would be like, sure. An Instagram, Instagram, an Instagram following that's big enough is not going to get you concerts on its own. But when you go to a society that wants to hire you and they look you up and they see that you have 30,000 Instagram followers, of they course. are much more likely to hire you because you are going to promote their concert series, right? So of course. it's like you of have course. something to offer. I think building your own following online, however size, whatever size that is, if it's a modest size, because let's say that your thing is like, I play new music and then I play local chamber music gigs with like more of the hits, right? So let's say like your chamber music projects are more like, piazzola stuff that you know you're going to get gigs with in your region and your more international concerts are like focus on like some weird new music or something but you get in with like good societies like that even if you're following on that new music thing is a smaller following those organizations are still going to look at that following and say this person has a following mm -hmm. they're a lot more likely to want to go with you than someone who maybe plays slightly better quote unquote i don't know mm -hmm. it, I, i've got some brazilian friends and they were telling me that there there was some grant application thing and question number one i'm going to paraphrase and i'm not going to tell the story correctly but yeah. it's like question number one what is your name question number two how many instagram followers and, and youtube subscribers do you have yeah and most people didn't get past number question number two when when it came to the uh um the judging and everything because they they were looking for the people with the biggest uh Following, net yeah. to cap yeah which is which but, is and, harsh, and, and but here's it's the reality i mean and, and here's what I was talking about more with, with why analytics are more important. Um, I don't think subscribers mean anything. I, I, it's actually a, a very bad uh, um, Just like data views. point to wage because uh, audience retention is so much more important than, than subscribers. You can have 50,000 subscribers. You post a new video. You're not guaranteed that all 50,000 are going to watch. You're not guaranteed a single one of them will watch. Yeah. So I think... Audi Quality or quality audience is the most yeah. important thing. I agree. Like engagement, like people engaging with what you do because they find it valuable artistically and, and it mm -hmm. gives them something they want, you know, that means like, a lot more like, in the long run. So for, for the people watching, um, a share is much more valuable than a like. A share is much more valuable than a subscribe. Yeah. For you to actually share content, it, it goes a long way. And um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do this to toot my own horn or anything, but when the, the pandemic started, I, I actually made a point of buying a lot of CDs or like CDs on iTunes from people I know or, or anyone that I, I was a fan of, because that's going to go a lot further than liking a video and yeah and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm, for sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> Halim said something I want to address. He said, I think when the goal is about money, we lose all music sense and evolution. Don't you agree? This is actually something I wanted to touch on is that like for me, you know, you were talking about the net loss of doing content online. Part of, and, and I mean, this might be a little bit naive, but part of the things I factor into whether it's worthwhile to do is, does this fulfill me artistically to put this thing out and for people to engage with it and enjoy it? Which sounds kind of, and I don't want to be, and I, at the same time, I really don't want to be one of those people who's like, just do it because you love the art and that's enough. Like, blah, blah, blah. like no, I have to make a living. And like, this is where I don't necessarily agree with you, Helene, but I guess I'm agreeing with you and disagreeing with you at the same time. I, I don't agree on that because I, I need to make a living. And so I have to think about money with regards to this, unless I want to just do this as a hobby, which I don't. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been doing for the last decade. I've been doing it as a profession, you know? But at the same time, I also do want to consider when I'm making online content and videos and stuff, uh, just the question of does it make me feel fulfilled artistically to put this out and to make this video like I put so much work into my last, latest video of Shadow Prism this like contemporary Canadian piece and like I put way more like that was a huge net loss the amount of effort I put into that piece <laughs> and like a lot of people aren't gonna like love that piece because it's weird I think it's an amazing piece I think it actually is accessible despite all that but to me the benefit of like artistic expression that I got out of it was still made it worth it for me you know Mm -hmm. So I, I think I can paraphrase what you're saying. Sure. I went on a long rant. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's fine. But uh, <laughs> that was the artistic way of putting it. I'm going to put it much blunt, much more blunt. Um, you can be artistic to whatever degree you'd like to do. But all right, this sounded so much better in my head. But you still uh, have well, to pay the bills. 
But you still have to pay the bills. So yeah. you, you can you can be preoccupied 99% of the time with paying the bills or 95 or 90% of paying the bills. Yeah. But in that moment of playing the piece, you can be 100% dedicated to the music. Right. And this is something else too. Like I honestly, I sometimes I envy people who can just do their hobbies for fun and not have to have it be mm -hmm. a business thing. But at the same time, we also have to balance that ourselves. Like sometimes mm -hmm. teaching for me, as much as I love teaching and it's related to guitar and I teach music I love, sometimes I teach music I don't love, et cetera. But like sometimes it's nice. And even in the pandemic when I couldn't perform, knowing that I was like making enough teaching that I could survive is like kind of nice to be like, I can play whatever the hell I want. I can record whatever video 100%. I want. I can like be artistic in whatever way I want. Instead of like, what do I have to put on my program to like get this gig? You know, I don't know. hundred percent. It's yeah. That was kind of a blessing in disguise actually with the pandemic. I, I, um, I actually played in a masterclass a couple of weeks ago for this uh, composer. And he's an uh, amazing composer. It, uh, it's a Spanish guy. His name is Marco Smiley. Mm -hmm. Go look him up on YouTube. Like, just click everything. It, it's it's amazing. And uh, I forget where I was going with this, but it was a great experience. <laughs> nice, awesome. Uh, I think yeah, I think we agree on this. But I but I appreciate your insight into you know thinking about it. And and I kind of wish that. I just, I just hope that people. Are... Oh, oh, I remember, I remember what I was gonna say. Okay, go with it. <laughs> uh, in, in preparation for the class, I actually, I played the piece I was gonna play for some people, and like one of them turned around and they're like, "Would people enjoy that? Like, what? Why did you learn that?" I go, "Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed this piece, and I would program it without hesitation. It's part of a bigger work, and I'd, I'd actually just love the opportunity to go and play the entire work for someone." And they go, "Oh, okay." Yeah. And that's it. It's just in my time when I want to express myself musically and I'm enjoying the piece, my interpretation, and, and that's what I would do in a concert. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm confident it would come across well. It would work. Yeah, for sure. Um, Samuel says, love your work, Mike. Keep it up. See you, Zach, with a heart emoji. It was nice chatting with you guys. Thanks, Samuel. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. And Halim well, says, or... sorry. Au revoir, Samuel. Au revoir, Samuel. Uh, Halim says, that's what you are doing, sharing with us, and is very valuable. Thank you, Halim. I really appreciate that. And I want to be clear that while I might disagree in some way with your comment, I also agree with you that we don't want to lose sight of the music. Uh, he says, we sure all need something for a living, but I mean more thinking music at first. Right. I mean, that's the problem, right? Because we can think... I don't. I think this is kind of a false dichotomy that like music comes before making a living... Mm -hmm. you, I think it's you have to balance both and like like uh, here in Spain to be self-employed it's called autonomo like you're autonomous you're you're on your own you're 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 your own business and I have some friends of mine that are a couple of years younger but a lot of them were they're like graphic artists and illustrators and whatnot mm -hmm. and I, I remember telling them I go no you're not an artist you are a business owner and you're selling your art. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it because you're still doing the art for artistic reasons, but then you are figuring out ways to sell it. And sometimes mm -hmm. you won't sell it. I might learn a piece and make a recording that doesn't sell mm -hmm. at some point compared to learning some other piece that I may not be as stoked about that does sell or something. I don't know, but mm -hmm. yeah, I am still a business owner trying to sell my art in some way or my knowledge. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, Yvonne Lim says, thanks, guys. I feel smarter already. I don't think you needed to get smarter, Yvonne. You're a smart guy. Um, yeah, actually, I, I think Ivan, Yvonne's going to come on. Ivan, Ivan, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name, man. He's going to come on like in a month or two, I think, and talk. Because he, he plays guitar at a quite a high level. But he's also, um, his I think his profession is writing, right, Yvonne? Correct me if I'm wrong. But he writes. And so, he yeah, he, he has kind of an interesting perspective on this stuff, too. Um, oh, nice. Well, okay. Zach, it's been awesome having you here. This has been amazing. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, please put them in the chat now because we're going to sign off soon. Is there anything you want to address or ask or talk about or mention? No, no. I think were we planning on talking about Nathan's different hairstyles over the years? Oh, right. That was something. Oh, also, Ivan says, yes, author. There you go. The author. Ah, uh, okay. Exactly. I think so, did you, someone, Steven told me, Ivan, that you wrote like you did interviews with like John Williams and stuff back in the day. Correct me. Please tell us if that's correct or not. Cause that would be awesome to hear some, some stories about you meeting John Williams. 
Um, sorry, Nathan's hairstyles. We were gonna. You were. It's... So I met him, and it was long. And then yeah. a couple years later, it was short. I had the same experience. It's so crazy. Well, what? <laughs> yeah, I know. Long haired Nathan, and then short haired Nathan. I know. It's crazy. Um, Whoa. Yeah, both both members of our duo, me and him, both have lost hair over the years. It's just mine is like <laughs> disappearing here, and you know his just got shorter. Yeah. Um, hey, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, where you're originally from? Somewhere in Alberta, right? Spruce Grove, just outside Edmonton. Then you lived in Vancouver, and then you're abroad, right? I was Vancouver. Oh, sorry, Edmonton. Well, I actually grew up for ten years of my childhood in Indonesia. Oh, okay. Um, but then was in Edmonton for part of my childhood, and then went to Calgary. I did an undergrad in Calgary, and then I went to okay. Vancouver. Then I went to Vancouver, and then here. So yeah. So what? Ho- who's your hockey team? I see. I didn't really grow up watching hockey. I grew up watching f- football, soccer, because of being in Southeast Asia. Ah, okay. Um, so actually, that's your... not fair. My dad tried to get me into hockey, but I was also not a very sportsy kid mm, or okay. person in general, so I didn't really. Take just like growing up <laughs> growing up somewhere in alberta living in one place on another right yeah i sort of was annoying and poured disdain on hockey in general throughout my teenage okay. years i think i was like an emo kid and then like into like hardcore music and then into like classical music so i was always kind of like sports you know even though right. sports is super cool but i i was <laughs> judgy about it um Ricardo Saeb says a lot of food for thought. Thanks for sharing. Thank you for being here. And Mark Hilliard, Mark, Mark Wilson says, thanks guys. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much for tuning in. And, um, Ioana says, I think a big responsibility is in contributing to education. Hopefully values will shift in appreciating music as much as kids sports. Thanks for your great conversations. I agree. Yeah. I, I love, mm-hmm. I love being an educator. You know, I love teaching and I love working. And I, actually, you know what, this is, a deep thought I had <laughs> before this, and I, I don't know if we're going to kind of run out of time talking about this, but no. I, I actually just wanted to talk to you because you're, you're probably in a similar situation as I am where um, for a professional musician, we probably both started guitar rather late. Yeah, I started when I was 19 guitar and then classical guitar when I was 20. So <laughs> yeah, so I, I started guitar. I started guitar when I was 13 and I started classical guitar when I was like 15 and a half or something. Right. So that's already so late. I too. Actually, yeah. Yeah. I actually auditioned on like for my undergrad on grade three or grade four repertoire. Yeah. I right. Like I, I had six no months of playing. <laughs> yeah. Like, like in, you know? in many ways I had no business actually entering an undergrad program. Yeah. And the thing is here, like the Spanish conservatory system, like you're in the door when you're eight or nine years old. Yeah. So th- there are people who have been doing solfege classes for like 10 years. I know. And they're yeah. 17, 18. And like, I, I, my impression is that the, the, anyone who's finishing a, a I don't know what the system's like in the, in the Netherlands, but here you have, uh, it's called uh, Conservatorio Medio and then you have Superior. So the superior degree is equivalent to a, an undergrad degree in North America. But the, the issue is there are a lot of people that come out of a medio degree playing at arguably a higher level than a lot of third or fourth year undergrads at a, in the in North America. I'll put it this way. It, in the Netherlands, it's not that different than North America because there's a reason that the vast majority, I almost know no Dutch students in the conservatories here, the higher, like Carlos class and all these classes. There there are Dutch students. I don't want to, it's, it's not, but the there are a lot more students that come from other European countries where they have a conservatory system where kids go through it learning from a young age, classical music, right? So it, it is, it's it's different than I think Spain and Portugal and some of these countries, Italy and stuff where I know students from there and it's just, it's a different level of integration for the for the kid mm-hmm. growing up with that. Because you know. like, again, in thinking about this beforehand, both have the positives and negatives, right? Yeah. So here, here again, people are gonna leave they're going to have their, their medio degree and they're going to be, they're, they're going to have 10 years of training on it by the time they're 18. Yeah. Which is a huge advantage. Which is huge. But then at the same time, like you, you've probably matured and created a much more individual personality in your repertoire and your interpretation and your sense of phrasing because you started so much later. Maybe. Yeah. 
I do. You're, get, you're, yeah, I do get the sense. Of, I I know what you mean a little bit of like. How do I put this? Like the sort of wunderkind players who maybe won a lot of competitions when they were in their like late teens, early twenties, who play sort of very standard stuff at a very high level, but maybe don't know how to make a business out of it, you know, mm -hmm. and don't have like something necessarily. Ugh, it sounds terrible to say. Don't necessarily. No, no, have, no. You know, I, 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 you do you know, know what the term is? Uh, the the term is. Not sequential abilities. It's... Yeah, and I don't want to. I don't want to say this because it's not like everybody in that situation is like that. Just and and yeah, I don't know. I I sometimes I wish I could turn the the clock back and have started when I was a little kid and gone through a conservatory system like that. And then other times mm -hmm. I'm like, mm, no, I'm kind of glad that I quit piano lessons when I was after a year of it when I was a kid, and then I didn't pick up the guitar till I was almost an, or I was an adult, because mm -hmm. my my learning progress with it was different. And like even as a teacher, I really appreciate that now, like having that experience of learning later. I don't mm -hmm. know. There, yeah, there's just trade offs, you know. It's yeah, but it is interesting to see the difference in in educational systems that gives rise to these like different kinds of approaches and players in in the conservatory system. Um, mm -hmm yeah it's tricky um yeah but i think i think what you're speaking about is a real thing because i know some players from portugal and it's like it's crazy the level they're at when they are, are like arrive for their bachelor's you know and i'm like i'm never gonna play like that and i'm on my second master's degree you know like it's just yeah. well well yes and no but that, that's what i that's what i'm also kind of hinting at is you as someone who started later their probably their playing is probably much more textbook Maybe. right yeah Depends. potentially but the, the the other thing is you've also got experience working the night shift at this place and you've got experience doing that and this and this right yeah so the the, the chances of you actually sticking through adulthood with it and and developing professionally and personally with it probably far exceed what they're able to maintain because a lot of these people they they um they don't know what it is to work. So when you right. actually have to work and, and manage a practice schedule, like they're, they're playing that way because they're playing three, four, five, six hours a day for 15 years. Yeah, I mean, it, that's that's just an issue of like people in general though and students, right? I, I kind of, this is my constant refrain now is that people should sit people down at the beginning of a, a degree in music and say, hey, are you okay with like working 50% of your day when you finish not on music, but on administration? you know and then i would go one step further i i would say you know it's more important than your guitar lesson this class on grant writing and professional writing abilities yeah exactly or on like how to meet someone new in a new city and like build a network as soon as you move to the city and like go for beer with people you know yeah because <laughs> none of that none of that is 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 taught and it's it's a real shame because uh at least in Canada, the system is set up that like, hey, you're paying? Cool, great to see you. Oh, you stop paying? I'm not going to hear from you in like eight years and you're gonna, just going to check in. But there's no accountability for what happens after the student graduates to a large extent. Yeah. And and when, when things like grant writing, when things like uh, writing level and and how to or making an invoice or doing your taxes <laughs> yeah when none of that is taught what you're although you might you might be setting someone up for a successful concert or a you're not setting them up yeah you're not setting them up for a a, a, a business or yeah, and also i don't know man like the I, I actually don't want to just like shit on competitions because they have a lot of benefits too. like festivals and competitions have given me so much, not just in terms of network, but also in terms of pushing me as a player and helping me meet new people and expanding my artistic horizons. But like the sort of festival circuit mentality, right? Like it, I feel like it prolongs this attitude of like, just be the best mm -hmm. player, just be the best player, prove you're the best player, prove that you can play this repertoire the best. It prolongs that for so long for some of these people, I think. And then they're left at the end of it being like, wait, but where do I go from here? It's like, actually, all these other skills would have been more helpful in the long run for you as a business person. Um, and as an art, as an, as an artist presenting yourself to the, not just a business person, but presenting your art to the public, you know, even if it's a smaller public or something, I don't know. It's just the priorities seem a bit skewed to me of like the competition scene and the sort of festival circuit 
idea. I don't know. And then and then you can get into the whole breakdown of did that person deserve to win the competition? Yeah, yeah, that's another question. And 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 how much know. did you pay for flights and for beer and for the hotel? Yeah, I, have have you done a lot of competitions? Because I've I've never actually done one. I I, 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 seen I, a... I went through a phase where I was doing them fairly recent for a little while, fairly regularly. But it was like I was always paying my own way, and honestly, like going into debt sometimes to do it. And it was like the kind of thing where I would like go to like four or five a year and really prepare hard for them. But they, but I realized pretty early on that the competitions were kind of BS. So then I started choosing them based on the festival because I wanted to go to festivals where I like knew people and wanted to meet new people. And I knew it was mm-hmm. like a cool place to be and there was a lot going on and I could meet new contacts and, you know, build a network around first around Canada, but then internationally. Right. So for me, it became very quickly like. And also I started choosing, honestly, I started choosing to do some competitions selectively when I knew I could play for a public round when the semis mm-hmm. were more likely to be open or the whole thing was open to the public because I feel like the point, this is something Marchandela said, is the point of going to a competition is to win fans and you win fans by having people hear you're playing. So playing for judges actually does nothing for you, even if you win a prize, you know, mm-hmm. like you should be going to play for whoever comes to the concert hall to hear the competitors, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So No, I agree. I um I've never I did like one uh, RCM exam thing, but I, I I've never sought out the the uh, the competition being, line. Yeah, the being graded. Yeah, it's not a fun yeah. feeling. I'll tell you that. No, and 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 it, uh, Dia's hundred percent correct. I'd much rather go play a concert. Yeah. To, than than go play for five yeah. guitar players. But, but the point is, if you play in a festival where there's a public round, at least you're playing a concert for your friends and other potential networks. Like, I, I've gotten gigs yeah. from playing playing competitions where I didn't win. I was in the semis, mm-hmm. and that was open to the public. And there's one festival that I won second prize, and then I didn't get any concert out of it. And then the year before, I had didn't pass the semis, but I got three concerts out of it because some guy saw me who, like, did local concerts in the area and really liked my playing and brought me there. Oh, that's great. The next year, you know, so it's like, it's like things like that where you're like, remember that price doesn't mean that much compared to like <laughs> the people who are going to see you, who might be interested in helping you collaborate in some way or finding a way for you to play. I don't know. It's mm-hmm. just, yeah, it's, it's exhausting, but it's also, I love festivals. I miss them. I miss going to see my friends and, and meeting new but, friends. But festivals and... are, are, festivals are, are different than, for sure. for sure yeah. yeah but they're they're often they overlap right like it's not like yeah yeah okay. anyways um mm-hmm. ivan lim sorry i missed this said uh as a journalist he's talking about um writing for uh, writing about john williams john mills too cool oh yeah um, nice funny funny enough um first time i was in spain I, I wrote to john mills and i said hey my teacher steve he studied with you like 30 years ago Whereabouts are you? Maybe we can get in contact. And uh, it, nothing happened. But during the quarantine, when I recorded the Smith Brindle, I just sent him the video and I said, "Hey, I don't know what you're doing, but I, I recorded this." And he, he, John was nice enough. He like sent me back a lot of feedback. Nice, cool. It was, it was really, really appreciated, and, and it was awesome. really fantastic stuff. So yeah, uh, Halim says thank you so much. Lots of best wishes for both of you. Thank you, Halim. So nice to see you again. Um, mm-hmm. Ioana says the trick is to have your identity not completely entangled up in the music. Very true. Starting young is great for your musical abilities, but having having an identity well built independent of music makes you more resilient. I agree a hundred percent. I think that's important. I too agree. So therefore, we agree two hundred percent. Yeah, two hundred percent. And I also just want to say, people who start young and who you know win a lot of competitions when they're young and stuff too doesn't mean they can't build that individual identity. Right. That's mm-hmm. not the point. It's just. I, I guess what I'm what I'm saying and what you're saying is that it's not a substitute for it to be like successful in these other ways, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. There, there's a big difference between uh, conquering the niche market of classical guitar competitions yeah. versus the general public. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's, I mean, to some extent, our audience is guitarists. That's hard to get away from to some extent. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's it can't be everything, or it shouldn't be everything. Uh, Josh Searle says, nice to tune into your show. Thank you, Josh. Always good to see fellow Canadians out in the world. Yeah, representing us well on the international stage. I don't know about a stage. I'm not really... <laughs> I'm, no one's on a stage right now because <laughs> of COVID, unless you can't YouTube. Uh, great topics. We'll tune in again for sure. Thanks, Josh. I really appreciate it. would love to see you here again. Okay. Wow, Zach, we went almost two hours. I think we've we've exhausted everything we had to say, probably. Maybe. Do you want to find out? 
Okay. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm getting a little tired here. It's almost 10 p.m. We didn't talk about gardening. No, we did Oh, I forgot about the gardening. I even mentioned it in the blurb, I think. Stay tuned for next time. <laughs> gardening episode. Zach will be in his garden with a camera. Like. Yeah, well, uh, give me a month. Everything should be planted by then. And nice. Okay, you can give a little on. video tour on, on uh, Messy Desk. Of course. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Stay uh, tuned for Zach's garden update. <laughs> garden update from Zach Lee. Um, I appreciate your time and your thoughts, man, and your playing. We're going to listen to one more recording as we fade out here when we say goodbye. Oh, quickly, Brody, who's in Victoria, says, Great show, guys. Looking forward to garden recordings. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and Emily Shaw says, Hi, Zach and Mike. Just caught the last half hour here. Always good to hear these chats. Thank you, Emily. Um, Hi, Emily. Yeah. Thanks. So Actually, much. Emily should we should she should join in on the uh, on the garden update. True. Yeah. She's got that's gardens true. going. That's true. Um, that's a good idea. Yeah. Emily and Craig were on here a little while ago, but I I think I should probably have her back on because she has a new CD coming out. I think mm -hmm. this summer. Sorry, Emily. I'll I'll send you an email, Emily. Just keep an eye on your inbox. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyhow. Okay. Well, we're gonna fade out with this Alan Marsden piece, right? Yeah. Do, you want, do you want to say anything about it? Uh, yeah, so uh, Alan was a, another teacher of mine. He writes beautiful, beautiful melodic music. So uh, this was a set of three pieces that I that I play in concerts all the time. Cool. And and yeah, so there you go. Nice. Okay, we're going to listen to Zach play some Alan Marsden. Thank you, Zach. You've been a gem. And oh. I will, I'm sure, you know, we'll talk again publicly soon, hopefully. Um, and thanks awesome. everyone for tuning in. This has been great. All right. Okay. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's been fun. My pleasure. All right. Okay. Ciao, everybody.
Thank mm -hmm. you. 